how are you? How's it going? Hope you're doing all right. Happy Friday. Ah, it's been an interesting day. Check these out. I uh, crocheted ear covers for my thing. I don't know if you can really see. <laughs> I was crocheting other ear covers for my other thing like I sh was sh uh, doing yesterday. And I finished those. I was like, hey, I can make some for my for this headset. And so I did. And actually, they fit much better than the donuts. As much as I love the donuts. Okay, the donuts are cute. These do get very dirty, though. And um, they're kind of a little more floppy on the, on, the, um, on the ear covers. And this one, these are just, like, nicely fit. So I'm very happy with these. <laughs> and they look, they look nice. They look very nice. And they're nice purple. And I like purple. So there we go. <laughs> anyway, hello everybody. Welcome to the stream today. I hope you're doing well. And it's Friday, so today is podcast day where I'm going to read to you at 8 o'clock the next four chapters of Consortium. And uh, we're getting into the super spooky bits of Consortium. <coughs> oh man, I'm thirsty. We went out for dinner tonight and... It's hot out there. It's like 90 some odd degrees and humid, uh, you know, Florida weather. So, whew, I've been like trying to hydrate ever since I got home. But anyway, <laughs> uh, yeah, so today is Friday. So at 8 o'clock, we'll be reading. It'll be chapters 25 through 28. Yeah, 25, 26, 27, 28. Yeah. I can count right. <laughs> and, um, oh, I should bring that up for myself. I have a um, spreadsheet with m all my um, podcast information on it so I can keep track of episode numbers and things like that and where I'm at. Um, yeah, yeah, 25 through 28. Okay, great. <laughs> so how y'all doing? Hope you're doing great. Um, Yesterday was kind of crazy with, with the announcement of the verdict and all. And so that's kind of why we went out to dinner tonight. We were celebrating. <laughs> we went to the Chinese buffet, and it was really good. And they had really good watermelon. They, they have, like, a fruit bar. Like, this buffet is, like, what it means to go to a Chinese buffet. And, like, they have a sushi bar, and then they have, like rice and chicken and they have like all these fried foods and then they have fish and then like f cooked fish and raw fish and all that stuff and then they have a fruit bar and then they have a salad bar and then they have a dessert bar and I was just like my stomach was like we don't want we don't want cake today <laughs> we want fruit and I was like okay so they had like watermelon and oranges and like bananas and the strawberry sauce it was really good highly recommend Hibachi, Hibachi Buffet and Grill uh, um, in Florida, if you're ever down in the Largo area. Very tasty. So, yeah, um, if this is your first time here, first time hanging out on my stream, I am Gina, a.k.a. Worthy Advisor, and um, I write novels. And you can go check them out at that website up there. And I have four of them, actually. Um, the first three, and, and, and I read them on my podcast. That's what we're going to be doing today, later. And um, three of them are actually complete on the podcast, and we are currently working on book four. And um, should be a couple of months, and we'll probably have book five out, called Nematona. And, well, maybe a month or so. We'll see. It depends on, um, because my wife does my covers and my formatting, so she's kind of busy at the moment. <laughs> so we'll see how, how long it takes her to get that sorted out. But, um, yeah, we're, we're, we're hoping to have Nematona out soon as we can. Um, I'm really excited for you all to read Nematona, actually. <laughs> um, yeah, so book five should be coming out soon. And um, as soon as that comes out, I'll start you know, I'll start working on reading that one for you out live as well, so, um, but we shall see when that comes out. 
um, normally during the rest of the week, I do 20 minute sprints um, with a five minute break in between. And during the break, we chat and do tarot readings and, and, and I answer questions about writing and spirituality and all sorts of stuff. And people can redeem three card tarot readings on air or other tarot readings through channel points. And um, yeah, and we're going to do um, a couple of sprints before 8 o'clock rolls around today. And I'm going to just be journaling, maybe write answering a pen pal letter. Uh, I'll see how I feel. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, and then at 8 o'clock we're, we'll all start reading. I do need to get some more fluids, though. So I'll do that one when I turn on the, um, why is this so low? Okay, that, 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 yeah, okay, that's okay, okay, um, I, uh, for my head, for these headphones, I have a separate thing that does my volume for them, so, must, did I lower that? No, okay, <sighs> anyway, um, where was I? Right, um, so we're gonna do a couple Pomodoros, then we're gonna read, and then I'll send you elsewhere tonight, because I'm just gonna go to bed, I'm really tired today. Um, however, if you just want to hang out, listen to me read to you, or just hang out and let's have the noise in the background while you're doing something else, lurking is perfectly fine. Lurkers are love, and I love my lurkers, so no worries on that score. Um, and then I'll, I'll talk more about the podcast reading when we get to that. Um, do do all right. There, and, um. I don't know if you guys remember though, I do have four tarot decks now. I got this new tarot deck, which is really, really pretty, called Ephemera. So um, I am confident in reading with that now. So uh, if anybody wants a tarot reading, let me know. Um, oh, and, mm, excuse me, my goodness. See, I told you it's Friday. Um, during the sprints, I do turn off my mic, so, um, and we turn up the music, which is all done by my awesome wife, and her SoundCloud is in the chat right now, uh, so if you want to listen to her stuff after stream, you're welcome to go ahead and check out her SoundCloud, and there's actually a f number of, um, pieces that aren't on my regular playlist, so, um, because I, I, keep a certain vibe for the playlist but she has some other uh, really interesting tracks that um hello puppy <laughs> there's a very loud puppy i don't know if you can hear it but there's a very loud puppy um uh anyway <laughs> uh right so um all right so why don't we go ahead and um get started for tonight um, so, because I am running a little teeny bit late, but not too badly. So, um, why don't we get started for tonight? I'm going to mute my mic, <laughs> turn on the timer, and turn up the music. And I'm going to need to go and get some more fluids, because I need to refill my bottle here. And, um, but I'll be right back. And then, um, yeah, well, why don't we just go ahead and get started?
this page out. Can I take this page out? Yes. Hmm. I think I'd had perforations. Anyway. <sighs> So, well, how y'all doing? How's it going? How's your work? Whatever you're doing, going? Oh. <laughs> it's kind of funny, the LaCroix um, cans and case for the grapefruit um, ones. Um, for some reason, the ones right now have the French word for grapefruit instead of um, English. And I find that really funny, because it's like, most people wouldn't know what Pamplemousse was, unless you've been around French a bit. And, you know, growing up in New Hampshire, you know, you end up having a lot of French stuff around there, because we're closer to Canada. So, but yeah, that's kind of interesting. <laughs> mm. It is very good, though, I will say. Um, what was I going to do? I don't know. Um, you know, we're not going to, eh, I don't know what to do. I'm kind of like, eh, what do I do now? What do I do now? Dun, 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 dun. Uh, yeah. Talk amongst yourselves. Mom one was wondering if I heard anything, and I'm like, no, I have my headset on. So, <laughs> what color paper? I'll do the cream, get rid of that one. I love these Midori notebooks, they're really nice. Anyway, uh, guess we're alone now. Do, do, do. Uh, I'll try and like. No. I just kind of like don't want this stuff kind of falling out. There we go. Hopefully that helps. Anyway. <laughs> <sighs> brain. What is brain? I tell ya. My brain is all over the place. Because it's hot and I'm tired and. There's all sorts of stuff and things, and uh, life, and every universe, and everything. Oh, that was nice of him. I forgot that he had um, sent me stickers. Anywho. Uh, I think I'll write to my pen pal in the next Pomodoro. Because, why not? Oh, it doesn't have a thing. I should grab. I should put print another one of those out. I have a um, line thing, and um, you c I, I actually have a ruled guidelines that goes under this paper because the paper is thin. And um, I actually there is a website where you can um, actually create your own and print it out, which is really kind of nice. Um, and I like the red, actually. The red actually shows up better than black lines, which is kind of interesting. I'm not sure why that is, but um, it is a, it is what it is. <sighs> there, now I'm set for letter writing. Now I just got to decide which pen I want to use. Because I was already using that pen. Maybe I'll use my new Frankincense pen. There we go, this one. I like this pen. <coughs> All right, so we're gonna do this and um, then I'll read to you.
change your hey clock walk it good to see you hello let me just change scenes here we'll go 
Come on. There we go. Alright. Uh, do I need this? I should put this over here for myself in case I need it. And I turn that off. Okay, great. And I gotta bring up my thingos. There we go. <coughs> oh, excuse me. How you doing, Clockwatica? How's it going? Hope you're doing good. Oh, happy Friday. Right, I'm gonna turn this up a little bit. And it's up a little bit. Okay. Oh, I should take these off. I don't need these anymore. Ah, there. Don't need those to read the big letters on the screen. <laughs> uh, yeah, so for those who are new to listening to me read for the podcast, um, it's about an hour. It runs about an hour. It's usually four chapters. And um, we're actually getting into some creepy, 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 creepy stuff. Okay, I got some good news about one of my meds this afternoon. Oh, good. Good, good, good. I'm glad to hear that. Oh, hey, Clockwalk, I check these out. I, I decided that since I was making some for my other headset, I'd make some for these, too. And uh, I finished them today, earlier today, because they they're smaller than the other ones, which is great, so... Aren't they cute? Oh, I love them. And they're they're nice blue purple. And actually they fit much better than the donuts. Now, don't don't get me wrong, I like my donuts, but uh, these are much much more comfortable, I think. So they fit really nice and snug. And uh yeah. So, and the other one I finished and I actually put the cover on the headband. It looks really good and it's really comfy. So decided that I was going to, I, I, <laughs> I don't know if I mentioned this to y'all, but uh, I decided that I was going to give up on the Tunisian crochet because that was just t making me cranky. And the whole point of doing crochet is to relax. So I was just like, eh. So instead of that, I'm going to start learning more fancy crochet things. So like, you know, the headset covers and stuff. And I may even attempt clothing. <gasps> clothing has been my nemesis ever since I started crochet. I'm, uh, I'm kind of intimidated by it. So, we might try it, though. Because uh, I've been watching a, a YouTube lady that makes a lot of clothing. And she makes a lot of really pretty stuff. So, maybe I'll see if I can make a tank top or something. <laughs> I don't know. I'll think about it. I have a lot of nice yarn right now and some, and some cotton yarn. So, um, I'll have to think about what I want to do. But anyway, I can knit socks and fingerless gloves. That's the limit of my ability at this point. I've done fingerless, fingerless gloves. And you know what? The first time I did fingerless gloves. Ooh, dog sweater. That's cute. Yeah, the first time I did fingerless gloves, actually, I made them for a friend of mine. And I, and I used um, a very fine spun Angora rabbit fiber that from a rabbit that I actually took care of for a while. And um, I ended up having to give her up, the rabbit, um, because I, it, it was while, like when I was leaving my ex coven leader, so it was, it was a whole thing. And um, I gave the rabbit back to the woman that sold it, sold her, that sold me the rabbit because I figured, because um, she said that, you know, it'd be better if I just gave her back to her and then she could find another home for the rabbit. And what was really sweet of that woman is that she um, sent me her first clippings because um, these were the Angora rabbits that you actually have to clip, uh, clip the fiber. You can't just pull the fiber off them. And so I had this Angora fiber forever and my friend was getting hand fasted and needed a pair of gloves and I said hey I can make you a pair of gloves I have this because I had spun it into a really fine um, yarn and uh, on, a, on my shaker wheel and it was white and I actually dyed it to match her dress because she had like a, a 50s style dress with the hat and everything it was like a, a, a tweed suit 50 style suit which is really beautiful and she had like a little hat and everything that go with it and she wanted a pair of gloves to go with it and I said I'll make them for you 
And so I made these fingerless gloves for her. It had a thumb hole and then just like the top was open. And it had this really pretty shell pattern, except I used Angora fiber that I dyed myself. And if you know anything about Angora fiber, it is like fuzzy. Oh my God, that was the hardest thing I had ever crocheted and probably have crocheted since. Um, are you talking about my shaved head, Marcus? No, <laughs> it is not cancer. It is by choice because I don't like having hair, actually. <laughs> I think it's a ADHD, 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 ADHD thing for me. But no, I, um, I am bald by choice, by the way. <laughs> um, yeah, because I don't like having hair. So yeah, so those gloves are the, and I actually finished them while I was on a retreat at a um, Catholic uh, uh, abbey, <laughs> at an abbey up in California. Um, yeah, those were hard because like the fuzz made it so difficult, but they were really pretty. It was a very pretty pattern actually, and they had little silver buttons that I let her choose the buttons, and so. But um, uh, Marcus, though, <laughs> to uh, Fred Allen, can you take care of this person, please? Um, that is actually kind of rude. Um, yeah. <sighs> That's not something you like start with usually you start with hi and hello how are you how's your friday you know maybe some listening to what they're talking about um <laughs> i think i would know <sighs> let's sigh Although we went a week, we went almost a week without a troll, though. That's pretty good. <sighs> All right. Um, where was I? Yeah, we'll just, um, I think we'll just, uh, do the banination. There we go. Done. Ah, that feels good. Ban a good banning of a troll always is kind of nice. So, anyway. <laughs> Where were we? Um. Yeah. <sighs> I'm like... I just told you why, I, you know, that, that's a funny thing about some of these trolls. It's like, I just told you why I have no hair. <laughs> it's like, you, you, you don't, you know, cancer doesn't make you lose your hair. It's the treatment for the cancer that makes you lose your hair. So if... <laughs> yeah. In with Jesus, out with Satan. Right? <laughs> All right. <laughs> now that that's been taken care of. <laughs> All right. Um, anyway, so for any of the n other new folks that aren't going to troll me, <laughs> hopefully, um, I, uh, I do not really uh, pay attention to chat much while I'm reading. So, um, yeah, so we have our lovely moderator Fred Allen to sort things out if need be and um, I will say that th um, the next several ch uh, the next half of the book that we're going to be reading is really kind of creepy AF <laughs> just so you know and I forgot how creepy I made it so I'm just like oh dude so um so now would be a good time if you would not like to be spoiled spoiled for um, Consortium. 
if you would uh, to uh, tap out. Um, but otherwise, do enjoy the reading. And um, and I didn't get to the other the last week's podcast yesterday, but I'm going to get to both of those next week. So they'll be out next week and um, you'll get a, bon- a week of two episodes instead of just one. So... Mm. Okay, why did... Oh, I need to turn the sound off on my phone. There we go. Alrighty. Yeah, some of this one is really, really creepy. Cool, but creepy. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I like the way it came out, but oh my god, it's creep creeptastic. <laughs> so, okay. So, right, let me sort myself out here. Okie dokie. So, this is Consortium, Part 2, Poe, Chapter 25, Poe. Hey, you're good. Go on. See you at dinner, Kara the cook said. I put away the last plate and hung my apron on its peg on the wall. The food recycler turned off as I shot out of the hostel's kitchen. I ran to my room, picked up my bag with my tablet, and ran out the hostel door. Hey, watch where you're going said someone passing by. Sorry, I yelled over my shoulder. The Mercado was alive with people coming out for the midday meal. I stopped to grab a horchata and some lunch on my way to the Arboretum. It had become a ritual the last few days after I finished my trade chores at the hostel. I hoped today that Lazarus would come again. He came again to the same spot in the Arboretum a couple days after that first meeting. Well, fancy meeting you here again, Poe he said. Then we talked about so many things. I even worked up the courage to ask him about uh, old... <coughs> I even worked up the courage to ask him about old earth and its gods. Huh, he said. The old gods are pretty fascinating, aren't they? You know about them? I asked, shocked that he didn't just dismiss me. I know a few things about them. Lazarus thought for a moment, then said, I don't think gods really die, Poe. We still have their stories, and there are people who read those stories. Even if there are 99 people who dismiss the stories as just something interesting to read, if there's that hundredth person who believes that the stories are real, then the gods will find them. That thought rang like a... That thought rang in my head like a bell, but Lazarus left again before I could ask him more about it. After that meeting, I decided to come to the Arboretum every afternoon to see if I could talk more with Lazarus. It was refreshing to have an adult take my questions seriously. It felt as if it was something really momentous and that I was... It felt as if it was something really momentous and that I was just about to understand what it all meant. On the days that Lazarus didn't come, Tilla would sit with me. I told her about Lazarus and my thoughts about the old earth gods. Tilla didn't dismiss my thoughts either, for s- and Tilla didn't dismiss my thoughts either, and for some reason she looked worried more often than not. I also started to see her easier. She looked more real rather than see-through. Not that I minded, since it was less creepy, but when I asked her about it, Tilla just shrugged. I don't think she knew any more than I did. I stopped to catch my breath at the door of the Arboretum. It was quiet, like it usually was at this time of day. After a sip of horchata, I walked over to our spot and sat looking at the stars like I did the day... Mm. After a sip of horchata, I walked over to our spot and sat looking at the stars like I did the first day of my time off. Just as I settled in with my lunch, I heard footsteps behind me. Well, friend Poe, how are you this fine day? Good, I said. It's good to see you again, Lazarus. Is it now? He replied as he sat near me. That was an odd way to reply. Of course it is. Ah, child, you do this old man's heart some good. He looked out at the stars as he talked, with a sad look on his face. Is there something wrong, Lazarus? I asked. Not yet. What do you mean? He shook his head. 
Oh, don't mind me, Poe. It's just been a sad day for me. I heard some bad news earlier. Oh. I didn't really know what to say to that. But being here with my friend Poe helps a lot. Sometimes just being with a person who's sad or frightened or even dying is all you, that you have to do to help them. He had a look that reminded me of my Pepe when Grandma Jay died. Sad and far away as if he was seeing something that the rest of us couldn't see. There were so many people at the cycling, but Pepe just sat quietly in the big chair in the corner of the room. Although it made me think Lazarus was right. Because all I did was sit with him and hold his hand, but he seemed to relax more when I did that. More so than the people who talked to him and told him how great Grandma Jay was. I nodded and said, Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. He turned to look at me. I stared back at him, waiting for him to say something, but he just stared at me, as if he was looking for something. After a minute or so, he looked back out at the stars and said, I should have known you'd understand, Poe. I gave a small smile. We just sat looking at the stars. I wonder if I could talk to him about Tilla, I thought. I took a deep breath, then asked, Lazarus, do you believe in ghosts, like, of people who died? Yes, I do, he replied. Why do you ask? I see them. Well, one ghost, anyway. My friend Tilla. Ah, oh, I see. Who was Tilla? I looked at the ground as I spoke. She was my best friend. What happened to her? Lazarus asked gently. Tears threatened to spill, and I wiped my eyes with my sleeve. It was my fault. We were in the zero ball court at school. It was after the first time I shaved my head, and this boy was teasing me about it. When he teased me about really being a boy, Tilla got mad and rammed herself into him. He was bigger than her, and when they hit the wall, he shoved her back harder. But instead of hitting the wall, she slammed her head against one of the exit rails. In my mind, I could still hear the strange cracking sound that came when she hit the rail. It was as if time had stopped, and she just hung there, with her head hanging in a funny way. I really started crying then and put my head on my knees. Lazarus got up and came over to me. He didn't say anything, just put his arms around me. It was as if something broke open inside of me, and suddenly I was sobbing. He made soothing noises and just held me. A lot like Mama Jay did when Tilla died, but for some reason this felt different. As if I hadn't really cried about it before now. Oh, Poe. <coughs> oh, Poe, it wasn't your fault. It never was. I heard Tilla say. Hearing her say it this time just made me cry harder, and still Lazarus held me. She's right, child. It wasn't your fault, he said. That seemed to penetrate the grief, and I sat up, wiping my eyes with my sleeve. Lazarus handed me a bright red handkerchief. I took it, wiped my eyes again, and asked, You heard her? <laughs> You're not the only one who sees ghosts. I opened my mouth, then closed it again. He saw ghosts too? I'm not crazy? Lazarus shook his head. No crazier than I am, he laughed. Do you see the ghosts clearer now? Tilly used to be transparent, like a hollow, but now she's as real looking as you are. He looked at me again like he was surprised. What? I asked. I think... He started to say... <clears throat> I think... He started to say as he looked out the windows again. I think it's time for you to go home. His face became frozen as if it was stone, and I followed his gaze. At first I wasn't sure what he was looking at, but then there was something, 
moving outside the station. I could only see it because occasionally some stars would seem to go out. I watched it. I watched as it drifted past the windows, then disappeared as the station rotated. Lazarus stood, picked up my bag, and held out his hand. Listen to me closely, Poe. The next little while is going to be hard, but remember what Tilla told you. Talk to Loki when he gets here. He'll have people with him who can help you. It might be a while before he comes, but you're a smart kid, and I know you'll figure out what you need to do until they get here. I'll try and find you if I can, but listen to Tilla. She'll help you, too. Okay, I said, suddenly scared. Go on. Go home, he said again. I grabbed my bag and started back to the hostel. I turned back before I reached the trees, but Lazarus was gone. When I reached the hostel, it seemed that I wasn't the only one going back to their sectors. I saw Kara in the common area talking to people. Weaving my way through the other people leaving, I made my way to her. What's going on? I asked when she was free. Oh, thank the ancestors you're back. Frida's having us go to our home sectors. There's... Oh, thank the ancestors you're back. Frida's having us go to our home sectors. It seems there's a thing outside the station, and she's implemented safety procedures. You should go to your room and get your stuff. The trams are going to be crammed, and it'll be a wait to get home. Oh, yeah, okay, I said. Lazarus had told me to go home, too. Did he know what this thing was? Was it dangerous? Go on. I've already notified everyone's sector contacts, so they know you're on your way back. Another pus Another person took her attention, and I did as she said. I packed up all my stuff and headed for the tram station. The wait was really long, but I managed to squeeze into a tram eventually. People were talking about the thing. Some were excited, and some were nervous, but no one seemed scared. I wondered if the fear I felt when I was with Lazarus was real. From what I heard as the tram sped along the core, the thing just stopped next to the far end of the station and stayed there. It didn't seem to be doing anything. Surely Frida will figure out what it is, won't she? Asked an older woman sitting next to me. Oh, of course she will, Peggy, said her friend. She's our AI. Her and the council will sort this out. You'll see. I hope so. It'd be a shame to miss Orta's recital next week. The two women continued to talk about other things as if there wasn't some strange object next to the station. I clutched my bag tighter and wondered why they weren't scared. Part of me thought it was silly to be scared if the adults weren't scared. But then I remembered what Lazarus had said and, more importantly, how he said it. There was one adult who was at least worried. I didn't think he was exactly scared, but he was worried. And he was the only adult that believed in ghosts and gods and strange things. <sighs> I decided to believe Lazarus. The rest of the week passed, and the space nut, as some people were calling it, after the pictures from the pickets came in, was still just sitting there doing nothing. I tried telling Daddy Shen one night that I was scared of it. Why are you scared, honey? He asked. I... I realized then that I couldn't really tell him about Lazarus and what he told me. I didn't think he'd believe me. I thought for a moment. I don't know, Daddy, but something about it feels wrong. It's creepy just sitting there. I suppose that could be creepy. The ancestors know that we haven't encountered other sentient life in the universe yet. Maybe they're just checking us out, and eventually we'll say hello. Maybe they're trying to figure out how to communicate. That's why they're there. They're learning about us. I suppose, I said. Now, I hear that you're going to be Counselor Letty's assistant for a month or so. Yeah. Oh, come on now, Poe. It won't be that bad. You'll get to see how things on the station work. You might even get to talk to Frida. Wouldn't that be something? I hadn't thought of that when they gave me the assignment, but even if I could hear Frida, that would be cool. Yeah, that would be really awesome, I said. Daddy Shen came over and rubbed my head. Daddy, I giggled as I faked ducking. 
Don't worry, kiddo. Things will be alright. Yeah. <clears throat> Working for Counselor Letty ended up being more about getting her tea and keeping her schedule than anything else. The first couple weeks were boring. My work consisted of telling a lot of adults that she was busy during meetings or her scheduled studio time. After the first few days, I didn't really envy the counselors as much as I did before. They may be enhanced to talk to Frida on the regular, but they had to deal with so many problems that came up. I wondered if they kept us as apprentices and as secretaries so the adults wouldn't yell at them. A lot of adults seemed to come in really mad, but then see me and try to calm themselves. I was sitting at my desk one afternoon while the counselor was in a meeting reading one of the I was sitting at my desk one afternoon while the counselor was in a meeting reading one of the ancient earth books of mythology when a tall person came in they were looking around as if someone was following them when I looked up at their footsteps they were looking around they were looking around as if someone was following them when I looked up at their footsteps Finally, seeing me, they marched up to the desk. I have to see Counselor Letty, they demanded. Do you have an appointment? I asked. No, little girl, I don't have an appointment. I need to see her now. I bristled. I'm not a girl, I said. That was rude. Whatever, just get Letty out here. I'm sorry, but I can't. She's in a meeting. No, no, she has to come out. I have to tell her something. Something from the ancestors. I blinked. Can this person see a ghost, too? I can let her know you're here. If you give me your name, I can send in a message. My name? You don't need my name. Go in and get her now. They came around the desk, lifted me off the chair, and shoved me hard towards the door. I yelled as they grabbed me, which brought people out of the counselor's office. Orda, what in the world are you thinking? Poe is just a child. She turned to me and helped me off the floor. Are you okay, Poe? I nodded, too stunned to speak. Orda rounded on Counselor Letty. But, Letty, darling, she wouldn't let me in to see you. The ancestors say that you're going to die, but I told them they were wrong. See, they're coming down the hall now. Letty, I have to get you to safety. You can't stay here. Orda started pulling on Letty's arm, but Letty resisted, looking confused. Orda, darling, there's no one here. Come now, let's go into my office. See, I'm okay. She took their hand. They seemed to calm down a little bit, but were still agitated. Here, follow Megan, love, and I'll be in in a minute. Orda followed. Somehow, with their anger deflated, they seemed to shrink a bit. Once the door to the office closed, I realized I had started shaking. Counselor Letty came over and put a hand on my shoulder. Go home, Poe. In fact, take tomorrow off. I'm sorry Orda did that to you. They haven't been feeling well for the last couple of weeks. She looked towards her office. I think performing is starting to wear on them. I nodded. I hope they feel better soon, I said, and turned to leave. One of the other counselors barged in just as I got to the door. I managed to pin myself against the wall to keep from being run over. Letty, it moved. What? she said. It moved. It snaked out something that looked like a vine, and now the vine's attached to the station. Frida, Letty asked, is this true? Yes, Letty, the AI said. I widened my eyes in surprise. I had never heard her voice before. The vine also appears to be growing, and quickly. Letty swore, and I probably would have giggled at her swearing if I wasn't so scared. She looked thoughtful for a moment, then looked up. The woman was about to say something to the other counselor, but saw me first. Poe, go home, she said, and I gladly followed her command. On the way home, I remembered what Lazarus had said again, and wondered if this is what he had been talking about. Chapter 26 Poe 
I didn't actually run out the door of our quarters, but I walked really fast. <coughs> I didn't actually run out the door of our quarters, but I walked really fast. The station lockdown was making us all irritable, and I had had enough of people sniping and arguing. I mean, Mama J argued a lot with people, but that's just who she was, but Mom and Papa yelling at each other? That was not okay. I couldn't take it anymore, so I grabbed my bag and my tablet and told everyone I was going for a walk. I honestly don't think anyone heard me say it or really cared. Everything felt weird since the vines covered the station. It took two weeks for them to cover the whole thing, and the council ordered us to stay in our sectors for the time being. Thankfully, after the first month, we didn't have to stay in our quarters anymore, which made things a little more bearable the second month. But only a little, especially since people seemed to start acting like Orta when... <coughs> but only a little, especially since people seemed to start acting like Orta did when they threw me off my chair in the counselor's office. When I finally slowed down, I was on the far side of the sector where one of the star lounges was. I took a breath. After the Arboretum, this was my second favorite place to go. It was one of the few lounges with a window, and it was shared with all the floors of our sector. I took a lift to the outermost sector, heading to my usual spot, hoping that it would be empty. The elevator was glass, so you could see all the other floors as you passed. I could see people sitting and walking, but something was just off about how everyone was moving. The fear I felt when Lazarus told me something was coming filled me again, but I tried to push it away. The lift stopped and the doors opened. I walked out of the lift towards the windows. There were other people in the lounge, but it seemed quiet enough. The windows curved around the corner of our sector so that part of the floor was actually facing space. It was strong enough to stand on, and when I was little I would pretend that I was in space when I stood on it. I loved to lay on the windows and watch the station spin and the star rose. I loved to lay on the windows and watch the station spin and the stars rotate. But when I got to the middle of the lounge where the windows started and I But when I got to the middle of the lounge where the windows started and finally really looked at them, I was shocked. The vines covered the outside of the surface nearly completely, except where the window curved in towards the core. I could see the neighboring sector, but the stars were gone. I cautiously walked out to the edge of the windows. There were other people standing or sitting on the windows. One person was even sleeping. I looked down, and the vines overlapped each other. I could see small holes here and there, but the stars didn't shine through. I didn't know why, but I wanted to cry. It was as if the vines had taken something special from me. I stepped forward, but before I could look down at the vines, I felt something move through me like static electricity. It gave me goosebumps all the way up through my head. I jumped back, startled. I must have made a noise, because one of the people on the window looked at me. They walked over towards me, but didn't leave the window area. You can feel them too, right? The patterns? They move and shift, did you know? Their voice was dreamy, as if they'd been drinking alcohol or something. I took another step back. Uh, yeah? I said. They nodded, turned around, and dropped to the window, laying down on it. They rolled on their back, writhing in a way that made me uncomfortable. One of the others, who were laying on the window, moved towards them, and they started making out. That was definitely something I really didn't want to witness, so I backed away from the window and got back in the lift. I keyed the lift for our floor. Tears still leaked from my eyes, and I wiped them away with my sleeves. I wished then that the core tram was operational so I could go to the Arboretum, but I knew that wasn't possible. I sighed as I got out of the tram and walked back towards our quarters. At least my room is private, I thought. I hope that things had calmed down. An ear-piercing scream brought me out of my thoughts as I turned into the part of the sector where our quarters were. I saw our neighbor's door open, and Becca was standing in the doorway. Her husband, Chris, was in the hall, and they were looking really angry. I stopped because they were between me and our quarters. I backed up and put my back against the wall. You motherfucker! How could you break that vase? I worked on that for hours. 
I don't give a shit about your fucking vase. Your art sucks anyway. Becca's face didn't look normal. Her eyes widened. I could see the whites around them. She screamed again, curling her hands like claws and launching herself at Chris. The larger woman slammed him against the wall and started hitting him with her hands. Hard. Chris tried to fight back, but after the first couple of blows, he stopped trying to fight and put his hands up to protect himself. For some reason, that made... For some reason, that made Becca angrier, and she started hitting him faster and kicking him. When he fell to the floor, she just kept kicking him over and over, spraying blood everywhere. I could see people looking out the other doors along the hall, but no one came to help. What's the matter with them, I thought? Why aren't the other adults doing anything? I looked around, and there were others watching, but they looked at Becca beating Chris as if they were looking at something at a gallery. My anger at the others finally forced me to move. I dropped my bag and ran over. Becca, stop! Why are you hurting him? You're going to kill him! I yelled. To my surprise, Becca actually stopped. She looked at me, but it seemed as if who I was didn't register. Becca shrugged, turned around, and walked back into their quarters, making bloody footprints on the floor. I ignored her and dropped to my knees next to Chris. His body was a mass of bruises and cuts, and his face... I nearly... I nearly threw up. Medical emergency, I called out. This is the med bay. I'm sorry, but we can't send anyone right now. You'll have to wait. Wait? Wait! Chris might die! I'm sorry, but we have too many in the med bay right now. If you can bring them in yourself, we'll take a look. The channel cut off. Wait! I yelled, but it was no use. I gripped his shirt and tried to pull him to the lift, but I wasn't strong enough. I was crying in frustration and confusion. Why did Becca do this? She loved Chris. They've been married for years. I looked down and saw that his head rolled in that funny way that Tilla's had. Oh no, 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 no. I thought, looking around, Help me! I need, I need to get him to the med bay! I yelled at the other people in the hall. No one came. Daddy Shen would help, I know it, I thought. I scrambled up from the floor and ran to our quarters. Daddy Shen, I yelled. No one was in the common area or the eating area, so I went to his bedroom. When I walked in, he was sitting in the middle of the bed, naked. It brought me up short. Daddy Shen? Yes, Poe, he replied without looking at me. I need your help. I don't know why, but Becca beat up Chris really bad. He's bleeding so much, and I can't move him myself. The healers can't come because the med bay is full, I guess. But they said if we could get him there, they'd see him. Daddy Shen blinked and looked towards where I was. Now why would I do that? We need to help him. I went to the dresser and pulled out a pair of pants and a shirt. Please, Daddy, you have to help me. I tossed the clothes on the bed, then reached out and tried to pull him off the bed. He screamed and pulled away from me, jumping off the bed and flinging himself against the wall. I froze. Why did you touch me? I didn't ask you to touch me. How dare you touch me? Get out! Get out! Get out! He yelled. In shock, I walked out of the room and the door closed behind me. No one's going to help you, Poe, said Tilla. Why? What's wrong with everyone? I asked her. You have to go back to Chris, she said. Remembering that I had just left him in the hallway, I ran out of the co uh, Remembering that I had just left him in the... Remembering that I had just left him in the hallway, I ran out of our quarters. He was still in the hall, groaning, but weakly. I knelt by him and took his hand. I'm so sorry, Chris. I can't bring you to the med bay. I'm not strong enough to carry you, and no one will help me. He gave a light grip of my hand and moaned. Then he let out a sigh, and his hand went slack in mine. Tears were flowing freely. Is that me? I heard next to me. I looked up, and it was Chris as he had been, not the bloody mess against the wall. I knew, like Tilla, he was a ghost. What happened, Poe? Becca beat you up, and I don't know why. 
I tried to get you to Met Bay, but I couldn't lift you. I'm so sorry. I cried. He knelt down and put a hand on my shoulder. It's okay, Poe. You did what you could. A light seemed to infuse him, and he stood up. Behind him, a bright light with, was blossoming and becoming bigger, blotting out the rest of the hallway. Chris turned towards it and smiled. The ancestors! They really are waiting for us, he said, with wonder. The light was warm, and I felt calm, like when I used to sit in the Arboretum. It was peaceful. I need to go, Chris said, and he started walking towards the light. I could see faint, bright, human-like shapes reaching out in welcome. But right before he reached them, he turned towards me and said, They tell me that you need to talk to Lazarus again. I don't know who that is, but I guess you must know. Bye. He waved, and the light surrounded him as he disappeared. I sat next to his body, not knowing how long or when I thought to let go of his hand. I was still sad, but somehow seeing that made me feel okay for a moment. I felt more real than anything else that was going on in the station. Poe, get your bag. You need to get out of here, said Tilla, with worry in her voice. But we're not supposed to leave our sectors, I said, as I got up and retrieved my bag. What about my parents? Poe, you need to leave now, she said again. I need to wash my hands, I said, and went back into our quarters. I went to the sink in the eating area and washed Chris's blood off them. He started crying again, but at this point I didn't care. I dried off my hands and went to my room. Poe, listen to me. Put some clothes in your bag and leave now. It's only going to get worse if you stay here, Tilla said again. The ghost looked me in the eyes, and I could see she was scared. Why would a ghost be scared? Tilla, I, I can't think, all right? <laughs> what just happened? I said in a rush. My brain seemed like it couldn't focus on anything now that I was in a quiet place. Tilla hesitated. You saw something humans rarely see, Poe. You saw someone's spirit go beyond. Some corner of my mind remembered the books I had read. You mean I really saw that? That was real? I said. My knees felt weak, so I sat on my bed. Yes. Poe, but you can't really think about that now. You need to leave. Now. I looked at her again. Why didn't you leave, Tilla? Tilla looked towards the door, then back at me. I promise to tell you later if you leave. Okay. I got up and went to my dresser. I looked down and realized I had Chris's blood on my clothes. I suddenly felt that I had to get them off of me as quickly as possible. I pulled them off, then dug in my dresser for fresh clothes and pulled out extra to put in my bag. As I was shoving them in my bag, I heard a loud thumping coming from the other side of the wall where Jules' room was. I grabbed my bag, put it next to my door, and went to see what was going on. No, Poe, come back! Tilla called after me. The door opened and I froze again. Jules and Mom were naked on the floor, kissing each other, and not like a mother and son. They looked up at me after a moment, both smiling. Oh, sorry, <laughs> we fell off the bed. Mom giggled. You want to join us? I didn't answer. I couldn't. I backed out of the room. Tilla was right. I couldn't stay here. I ran for my bag and headed for the front door. Where are you going, young lady? shouted Mama Jay behind me. The sound of her voice made my blood run cold. I turned around slowly. She was standing with her painter's apron on and had her hand on her hips. There was a palette knife in her hand with something dark on it. I took a step backwards. I'm going to the lounge to, uh, read, I lied. Well, you'd better come back for dinner, although it might just be me and you tonight. Why? I asked. Everyone else is busy, although your Pepe came to visit your papa and they've gone off together. 
She looked annoyed, like they just took a walk somewhere. What? Pepe is dead, Mama J. Oh, I know, honey, but Papa wasn't really understanding that, so I had to make sure he could see your Pepe, too, she said, waving the palette knife. I looked at the knife, and what I thought was paint was dripping off the knife as she waved it around. She doesn't use drippy paint, I thought. Po, that's not paint, Tilla whispered to me. Oh, Tilla, you tattled, Mama J said. The woman who used to be my mother started walking towards me. I don't have to show you anything, but if you're not back in time for dinner, I may have to. Uh, yeah, I'll be back before dinner, Mama J. Uh, don't worry, okay? All right, then. I'm going to go and finish my painting. Grandma J said it was my best one yet. She gave me a big smile, then went back towards the studio area. I bolted through the door. Till I'd been right made my way toward the trams. It was the only place I could think of that wasn't anywhere near our quarters. I had to dodge other people talking to the walls or wandering without looking where they were going. Right before I made it to the tram tube, I saw a person banging his head against the wall and screaming. I scrambled into the tube and onto the platform. Thankfully, no one was there. I bounced to the far side of the platform since the gravity was lower and tucked myself in the corner so that I wouldn't be visible from the tube entrance. I pulled my tablet out of my bag and pulled up the station map. I couldn't figure out where to go, and I was having trouble finding somewhere I was allowed to go. I got frustrated and tapped the command to switch to verbal input. The tablet chirped. Show me somewhere I can go where there's no other people, I said. I can take you to the maintenance sector and the outed storage bay. <clears throat> I can take you to the maintenance sector and the outer storage bays. There shouldn't be anyone there, as no humans are generally allowed there. I blinked. The voice sounded familiar. Frida? I asked. Yes. I thought for a moment and realized that it was the same voice that came out of the tablets when I used voice input. I... you... I've been talking to you all this time? surprise made me put aside my fear temporarily. Of course. But why am I talking like to mm, why am I talking to you like this now? I nodded. You seem to be the only person not affected by the vines. I don't know what they are doing to you all, but even my counselors have been compromised. Their enhancements seem to protect them for a while, but now I can't get through to them. I don't understand it, but I, what I don't understand is why you seem to be unaffected. I shrugged. I don't know why, Frida. Tears fell down my cheeks again. Why is this happening? I don't know, Poe, but I do know that I can protect you until I come. Ca mm. I don't know, Poe, but I do know that I can protect you until I get contact from my father. We're not the only station affected, so hopefully Father can help us. I wipe my eyes on my sleeves. Do you think he'll know what to do? I asked. I hope so. Otherwise, more people are going to die, the AI said. I hope so, too. There was a swishing sound, and a tram pulled up to the station. Get in, Poe. I'll direct you. I pulled myself up and bounced over to the tram. As the door opened, mm. I pulled myself up and bounced over to the tram. The door opened, and I strapped myself into one of the seats inside. As the door closed, I wondered just how long I could really survive. Chapter 27 Poe I pushed the metal box into the lift. The printer wasn't especially heavy, but it was big and awkwardly shaped. Frida had directed me to the closest one to the maintenance bay and Frida had directed me to the closest one to the maintenance bay that I was now living in. Why did I have to go get this food printer, Frida? I asked when I got into the lift. The doors closed and it started going back to where I was hiding in the maintenance bays. 
Because, Poe, it would take me at least a month to make one from scratch. This way, I can help you hook it up to the electronics in the bay, and it will work right away. Besides, you'll learn a bit of electrical work in the process. I grinned. <laughs> I had learned that Frida was always very practical. She was a lot like Mom used to be. She even made me go to bed at a regular time. I didn't mind, though. With Frida, it almost felt like I was living a normal life. The other reason, Poe, is that it's not safe for you to forage for food anymore, even from hydroponics. I tried to clear the way for you, but there are some people who would kill you if they saw you, I think. I shuddered. I thought of asking Frida how many people were left, but I didn't. If I was honest, I really didn't want to think about that. It's that bad, Frida? Yes, Poe. The thing I liked about Frida is that she never lied to me made it easier to know what was real and what wasn't. The lift stopped, and I dragged the printer towards the maintenance bay. Frida had closed off some of the bulkheads around where I was living to make sure no one else came down here by mistake. Occasionally, I'd hear crying or screaming on the other side of them. It always creeped me out when it happened, and I'd freeze in place until it stopped. Thankfully, there was no one near the bulkheads today. The door to my room opened as I neared it, and I got the printer through the door. Thanks, Frida, I said as she closed the door behind me. Where should I put it? The opposite corner from the shower and the toilet, Frida said. When I got to the corner, a panel popped open. Frida then told me how to connect the wires and tubes. I pushed it against the wall when I was done, and it began printing something and dispensing a drink. I think you deserve these after all that work she said. I took the drink first, which seemed to be some sort of citrus drink, and when the printer finished, I had a slice of honey cake. I gave a small smile. <laughs> you know a lot about me, don't you? I do. I took the food over to my nest of cushions and blankets, looking around. With the food printer, I now had everything I needed without having to go out into the rest of the station. It wasn't too bad, actually, since the bay was meant for emergency shelter anyway which meant all Frida had to do was activate the facilities. Frida explained, though, that normally those in the emergency shelter would be eating emergency rations for a short period of time. I had been eating those rations for a couple of weeks, and I thought they weren't too bad, really, but when I finally took a bite of the honey cake, I changed my mind. I ate in silence. Now what do I do, I thought. There were no more apprenticeships, or school, or, or family. I put down my fork and rushed to the toilet and lost the honey cake. Every time I thought about what I saw before I ran made me sick. Now that I had nothing to distract me, I couldn't avoid my memories. Poe, are you all right? asked Frida. I pushed the recycle button on the toilet and rinsed my mouth in the sink. Yeah, everything just snuck up on me, Frida. I've been so busy with getting this room sorted that I haven't really thought of that day again, but now... <sighs> what do I do now, Frida? I'm not sure, Poe. It will take time before I hear from my father. I haven't heard from Alpha or Carver, who are the closest to us. It could take months. Months? Yes. Tears came then. Months alone? You're not really alone, Poe, said Tilla. You're back, I said. Yes, I've come to help you, and I brought someone else. She pointed behind me, and I turned around. Lazarus? The man nodded and opened his arms. I ran into them, and he gave me a hug. I'm sorry I had to leave you for a little while, friend Poe, but I'm back now. It's okay, I... I started to say more, but then <laughs> the reality of what I was seeing sank in. I walked backwards, away from Lazarus. You're a ghost. Poe, who are you talking to? asked Frida, with worry in her voice. Ghosts, I answered. I could see them before the vines came. Ghosts? I nodded. They helped me. They told me to run. Who are they? she asked. Uh, I looked at both Lo Tilla and Lazarus. 
They both nodded. One is Tilla. The other is a man named Lazarus. Tilla? She said, with a hint of sadness in her voice. I nodded again. Poe, tell her it's not her fault. I'd... <clears throat> Poe, tell her it's not her fault I died. It was an accident, and I know it. The rails were there for safety reasons, and she did make them high enough. It's just that humans are unpredictable. You both did all you could for me, Tilla said. I repeated the words to Frida. Frida was quiet for a moment, then said, Yes, Tilla is correct. Thank you, Poe. I had the feeling she left, as she sometimes did. She's grieving, said Lazarus. How can she grieve? She's an AI, I said. He smiled. <laughs> when humans created AIs, they gave them more than they thought. Loki and his children, even more so than most. Don't doubt Frida has feelings, Poe. They're not exactly like human emotions, but she can certainly feel things. I was suddenly very tired, so I went to sit at my nest again. Tilla and Lazarus followed. I watched them find places to sit, then thought of something. Lazarus, why is it that I can touch you? He scratched his chin. I can will it to be so. I can't do it all the time, though. I'm a bigger spirit than your friend Tilla here. Tilla nodded. Like the gods I read about? I asked. Lazarus raised his eyebrows in surprise. Yes, something like that. I don't generally think of myself as quite that important. But... Why do I see Tilla so clearly now that when But why do I see Tilla so clearly now when she was transparent before? Tilla didn't answer but looked to Lazarus. He looked at Tilla for a minute then said, "Well, that's going to take a little explaining, but I think I'll tell you a story first. I must have given him a look because he gave me a look back." like one of my parents when they thought I was being silly. I pushed that thought away. Now, Poe, don't give me that kind of look. They're important stories, and it will explain a lot of things in the end. Do you have anything better to do right now? I shook my head. Right, okay. Why don't you get comfortable in your blankets there? I took out my shoes, piled a bunch of cushions together, and wrapped myself in a blanket. I waited. A long time ago, before even Loki was born on a planet far away from Earth, there existed seven nations. Each nation had a leader, and each nation had a different. F mm. Each nation had a leader, and each nation had a different philosophy or way of thinking. The biggest of the nations was ruled by a powerful woman, and because she was so powerful and wise, she was asked to rule over the si other six nations. She refused at first, because she didn't want that kind of power, but the other nations were insistent. After talking with the leaders of all the other nations, she went away by herself to think for a time. When she came back, she told the others, I'll rule only as head of the council with all the other leaders. I will not make all the decisions by myself without any input from others. The others thought this was a wise idea, and thus the Council of Seven was born. Lazarus paused as if thinking how to continue his story. The people of this planet lived a long time, many hundreds of years, so after a while there were no more arguments, no more wars. No one really died, not unless they were extremely old. They went to the stars, just like humans eventually did, but then they had explored as much as they wanted to explore. The people who left came back home, and one by one, the nations fell asleep. How could a whole nation fall asleep, I asked, half asleep myself. Much like you right now, Poe, they had nothing to do, and were tired from doing all the things they had done. Did they ever wake back up? I was really trying hard to keep my eyes open, but my body was betraying me. 
Yes, they did, Poe, but I'll tell you about that later, he said gently. Okay, Lazarus, I said as my eyes finally closed and sleep took me. When I woke up later, Lazarus and Tilla were gone. I got up, took care of necessities, and then printed some food for myself. As I ate, I realized that there was a lot I could do while we waited for Loki to come. Frida was an AI and had the knowledge that humans possessed in her <laughs> Frida was an AI and had all the knowledge that humans possessed in her libraries. No one could forbid me from reading or learning anything now. Frida Hello, Poe. It's good to see you finally awake. How long was I asleep? I asked. Around twelve hours. Really? I was surprised. I'd never been allowed to sleep that long unless I was sick. I didn't want to wake you. You'd been working so hard the last two weeks. I thought you could use a rest. Thanks, Frida. I guess I did. I finished the rest of my breakfast and put the pouch in the recycler. I'd have thought, Frida. You said it was going to be a long time before we heard from Loki, right? Yes, several months, possibly. I nodded. Well, it wouldn't feel right if I just sat around doing nothing. So I thought maybe you could teach me stuff? I'm still supposed to be in school anyway, and you have all the knowledge in the universe, so I can learn lots of things. <laughs> Frida gave a chuckle. I don't have all the knowledge in the universe, but I do have a good deal of it. Yes, that's a good idea, Poe. And, as a human, you need some sort of exercise, too. How about this? We'll do academics part of the day, and we can do exercises the other part of the day. I groaned, gym class? No, not le gym like you had in school. I think, given our circumstances, I should teach you how to defend yourself. For now, I can teach you basic martial arts, but I still need to figure out some way of letting you practice against a live target. You're going to teach me to fight? I asked, excited. No, Poe, I'm going to teach you to survive. Frida corrected, and she sounded sad. The memory of Mama Jay holding the pellet knife surfaced. While I pushed it aside, I think it helped me to understand why Frida was sad. I think I get what you mean, I said after a moment. I knew you would, Poe, she said. Shall we begin? What would you like to start with? I was reading about the old earth gods before everything happened. Could you teach me more about that? Hmm. Why don't I go through earth's history, and then you'll see where the mythology fits in. Sure, I said, and picked up my tablet. Chapter 28. Poe. The days melded into each other. I'd get up, eat breakfast, then have classes with Frida. After that, I'd have lunch and maybe take a nap, or play a game on my tablet. Later in the afternoon, Frida would teach me how to fight. Although, after the first week, it seemed a lot more like gym class than fighting. I know, <coughs> I know this isn't the exciting part, Poe, but human muscles aren't as strong when they live on a space station, and we need to strengthen them more. We have to make do with what we have here. I'd have you swim, too, but that section of the station isn't safe. That was pretty much the response to a lot of things from Frida, and it was becoming irritating. The walls around me began to feel too close, and no matter how much I kept myself busy, the memories of Mama Jay and everyone else kept creeping in. I felt restless and anxious, and it was getting harder to sleep, and the only reason I knew if it was day or night was because Frida would lighten or darken the room. Most nights I stared at the ceiling for a long time and until I gave up sleeping and turned on my tablet to read. Tilla appeared once in a while, especially if I was feeling sad. We'd talk for a while, and sometimes she would stay with me until I fell asleep. Those nights were a little easier. I tried to ignore what I'd seen when I left, but I started having nightmares about Mama J using my blood as paint. One time I woke up and I thought I heard Lazarus next to me singing. 
He had a deep, soothing voice, and it lulled me back into a dreamless sleep. I woke from another nightmare one morning and just didn't want to get out of bed. Facing life alone just felt way too much. I rolled over and put the blankets over my head. It was safe and warm, and I didn't want to leave. Poe, Frida said gently. Poe, are you awake? I realized I must have dozed off again as I opened my eyes, which were... I realized I must have dozed off again as I opened my eyes, which were gummed with sleep. Yeah, I replied from under the covers. Are you all right? No. What's wrong? Frida asked. What's wrong? Frida asked, sounding worried. I don't want to get out of bed, Frida. Just let me sleep. But... All right, she said, and was quiet. And somehow, Frida not yelling at me to get out of bed seemed to be the thing that broke down something in me. Some <coughs> and somehow, Frida not yelling at me to get out of bed seemed to be the thing that broke down something in my mind. All the memories of the day that I fled came rushing back, and suddenly I was up and out of the cushions and heading for the toilet. I was kind of glad that I hadn't eaten in a while, since there wasn't much in my stomach. It was hard for me to even stand afterwards, so I just curled up in a ball on the bathroom floor and drifted back to sleep. A while later, something woke me, though I wasn't sure what. I opened my eyes and realized there was a blanket on me. How did this get here? I thought. I moved slowly because I was stiff from sleeping on the floor. Wrapping the blanket around me, I got up and walked out of the bathroom area. My feet were cold and my mouth was dry. I stood in the middle of the room and looked around, not really sure what I should do. Everything seemed to be just too much effort. Slowly, I went back to my nest and burrowed into it. When I woke up again, I was tangled in my blankets, and it took some effort to release myself. Something chirped. I heard the drink dispenser go off, and then something rolled across the floor. I finished extracting myself from the blankets and saw a small box on wheels with a drink bottle held in the grippers of an arm. It slowly handed me the bottle, and I took it. It chirped again, then pulled the arm in and scooted against the wall near my nest. I grinned. The little box was kind of cute. Uh, thanks, I said to it, but it stayed still. You should drink that slowly, Poe, said Frida, gentle and low. It's been nearly twenty-four hours since you've had any nutrition. I nodded. I opened the bottle and took a sip. It was light and had a sweet salt slight It was light and had a sweet, slightly salty taste. I really wanted to chug it down, but I made myself do as Frida instructed. I was feeling numb, like my feelings were overloaded, and the faces of my family kept coming up between sips, and I wondered what had happened to them. Frida, what happened to my family? I finally asked. Frida didn't answer right away. They're dead, Poe. I need to see them. There's nothing to see, Poe. They're dead. I have already taken care of the bodies. Frida's voice sounded sad. I didn't want her to be sad. I wanted her to let me go back to our quarters. I needed to see things for myself. I don't care, Frida. I need to go there. I actually got up and put on clothes and shoes. Wait, please, Poe. I'll let you go, but you need to wear a pressure suit, okay? You can get it from the industrial printer in 20 minutes. Why? Some of that area still isn't clean yet. There are places that are pretty noxious and dangerous for you to breathe in. Okay... I said, giving in. Will you eat something before you go? It will take some energy to be in the suit. The thought of food made my stomach clench. I don't think I can, I replied. A nutrition shake? I can make it any flavor you think you could stomach. Strawberry? I asked. Yes, Poe, of course, she replied. 
the drink dispenser started filling a large cup with a thick pink shake. I took the shake, sat back down, and waited for the pressure suit to print. I came out of the tram tube that I had fled down not that long ago. The hall was empty, and things were eerily quiet. Wait, said Frida, and I froze. I didn't hear anything through the helmet of the pressure suit, but Frida had mentioned when I put it on that I might have to be routed around some dangerous areas. Go left, she said. But please, Poe, Frida said. I sighed, but did as she instructed. I realized after a few turns that we were going around to the other end of the station and coming back around. It made me wonder just what she was routing me around. I reached the end of the hall parallel to my family's quarters and rounded the corner into the corridor where I used to live. It was strangely clean, as if Chris's body had never been smashed against the wall. I could see where it had happened, though, as clear as it was yesterday. I was glad that his spirit had moved on before anything else happened. I was glad that his spirit had moved on before everything else had happened. I slowly made my way down the hall, trying to mentally prepare myself for going back into what had been my home. I heard a thud behind one of the doors and jumped. I swallowed hard. Frida, are there people still alive in this sector? Yes, Poe, but I locked as many as I could into their rooms for the moment. Some of them know how to disable the locks, though you can't stay long. Oh. I reached the door of my family's quarters and the door opened. The lights came on. The living and dining area looked strangely normal, but extra clean, as if Mom had been on a cleaning frenzy. I went to my room first. Everything was just as I had left it. I thought about maybe taking some of the things with me, but it all felt like someone else's stuff now. None of it mattered anymore. I turned from my room to Jules's room. The door opened. All of his things were there, and the bed was rumpled, but my brother was gone. I remember the last time I saw him in there with Mom, and the shake threatened to come back up. I swallowed again and backed away. I went to Mom and Papa's room next, but it was like Jules' room. The bed was rumpled, but there was no one there. I wasn't sure if I approved of Frida cleaning up before I came or not. I think a part of me wanted to know what happened, but a part of me felt I had seen enough before I left. Mama Jay's bedroom was the same as the others. Be careful, Poe, Tilla said, making me jump. What are you doing here? I asked her. You need me. My heart was still racing a bit when I went to the door of Daddy Shen's room. This room, too, had been cleaned, but the back wall of the room behind his bed looked funny. I moved closer and could see five holes in the wall. Four in a square and the fifth in the middle, above the square. You're back, Poe, said a familiar voice behind me. A chill went up my spine. I turned and Mama Jay was standing in the doorway. Mama Jay? She nodded. You didn't come back for dinner, Poe. I, uh... I forgive you, though. Oh, Tilla, it's nice to see you, too. Mama Jay walked into the room and over to the wall with holes in it. He fought me at first, but I think he was glad in the end. I didn't think I had a thing for sculpture until then, but maybe I learned some things from your mom over the years. Sculpture? I said, as I backed slowly away from the bed and put distance between me and her. Oh yes, mixed media, blood and flesh. He looked glorious when I finished hanging him up there. I thought I was going to throw up. I backed out of the room and ran to the bathroom, keying my helmet open. Tilla came with me and sat with me while I retched into the toilet, sobbing. Eventually my stomach calmed and it was then that I thought to ask, Frida, are there any humans alive in these quarters with me? No, Poe. Are you seeing ghosts? I swallowed again. Yes, it was Mama Jay this time. Did she really hang Daddy Shen on the wall? I. I. Frida began. Just tell me, Frida! I demanded. There was a pause. 
Yes. I started to breathe heavily. I felt like I was going to be sick again, but somehow I managed not to. She really is a ghost, Tilla. <coughs> she really is a ghost, Tilla. Tilla nodded. It wasn't too long ago, Poe. I got up from the bathroom floor. I was determined to get up and finish seeing the quarters. The only room left was the studio. Tilla got up with me. Are you sure you want to do this? She asked. I'm not sure, Tilla, but somehow I feel like I have to. She didn't say anything more, and I walked past her and straight to the studio. The door opened and I stepped inside. I stopped just within the doorway because there was a large sculpture taking up most of the room. There was string and metal and ceramic, along with paint and glass, but there were also large, flat-shaped holes in the sculpture, as if something was there and no longer was. I looked at the clo I looked at the closest hole and saw that there were two fused metal pieces with something white in it. When I got closer to where the metal was, I saw five pointed extrusions. Then I understood what the white stuff was. I backed away. Oh, but you haven't had a good look at it yet, Mama Jay's ghost said. Why? Why did you kill them all? I had a vision, Poe. I knew they were all talking about me behind my back. But in the vision, I saw the art that I could do with them, and I knew they were the best materials to use. N not your papa, though. He went walking with Pepe, and, well, his body wasn't as nice as the others. That makes no sense, I said. Of course it does, but really, Poe, you should have come home to dinner. I could have made you into something lovely. I broke and ran, keying my helmet back on. I didn't know where I was running to. I was just running away from those rooms. No, Poe, don't go that way, Till and Frida yelled, but I wasn't listening to them. I didn't even hear the noise I was making, my terror and grief making me blind to anything else around me. I don't know how long I ran, but suddenly I collided with something and was knocked onto the floor. I shook my head to clear it, then looked up. Counselor Letty was looking down at me. Well, Poe, I see you've been doing well for yourself, she said. Yes, very well, while the rest of us starve. Before I could say anything, the older woman lunged at me, brandishing a broken piece of thick glass that had cut her hands. There was blood dripping from her fist. Ghosts don't bleed, I thought. I scrambled backwards to try and get away from her, but I wasn't fast enough, and she fell on top of me. Suddenly, my suit turned matte gray and my helmet slammed shut. The counselor's knife bounced off and the woman screamed in frustration. Some displays came up inside the helmet and Frida said in my ear, I'm taking control of the suit. Just let your body relax and move with it. Okay, I said, terrified. But I did what she said. The suit made me kick upwards and Letty was launched down the hallway. Holy shit, Frida! I exclaimed. Yes, well, it's why I had you wait. We're going to run now. Just try and keep your body moving with the suit. Before Frida finished the sentence, the suit was running for me much faster than I could do on my own. Other people who had come out into the hallway from the noise were just a blur as I ran past. Tilla had disappeared, and I didn't know if the other humans were real or ghosts. At that point, I didn't care. I let the suit take me to an empty tram tube and crawled in. The suit launched me from the end of the tube straight through the tram door. Um, yeah. The suit launched me from the end of the tube straight through the tram door. The door slammed shut and I bounced off the wall on the other side of the car. Luckily, though, the suit cushioned me and I wasn't injured. The suit stayed gray, but it stopped controlling my movements. I strapped myself into one of the seats. Why did you run away, Poe? Didn't you like my art? I looked up and Mama Jay was in the seat across from me. Go away! You're dead! Leave me alone! I shouted at her. Mama Jay looked angry. Is that how you talk to your mother? She asked. 
You're not my mother. You're just a ghost. Does it matter? I'm your mother. Don't you need me? I unstrapped myself and moved towards the back of the car. No, go away. Somebody help me, I prayed. Anybody. Suddenly, a person in a long black cloak appeared in front of me, facing Mama J's ghost. You have been asked to leave, spirit. I suggest you do so, said the darkly feminine voice. Mama J looked at her in anger. Who are you to keep me from my own daughter? Your child is no longer yours. Be gone. The woman in the cloak held up a bone white hand, pointing at Mama J's ghost. The same light that came when Chris died flared to life at the end of the end of the car. No, I can't leave. Not now. Po needs me. Go, please, Mama J. I'll be okay, really, I said, with tears rolling down my cheeks. But you need your mother. No, Mama J. Not like this. Please go, I said quietly. She looked stricken, but turned to go. Before she was totally engulfed in the light, she stopped, turned, and looked at me as if she suddenly realized what she had done. Oh, Po, I am so sorry, she said, then took the last step into the light. The light went out, and the car seemed a lot darker than it truly was. The woman in the cloak turned around, but I could only see the bottom of her face. That was well done, child. I understand what Lazarus sees in you now. She paused. She paused, and for a moment I felt like I was being measured. Yes, I think he was right. Go, rest, child. The ghosts won't bother you again tonight. Before I could ask her anything, the woman disappeared. The tram stopped in my sector and I walked to my room, not exactly sure what had happened in the tram, and too sick and tired to care. And scene. <laughs> told you it was creepy. Told ya, told ya, told ya, told ya. <sighs> God, I forgot how creepy I made that. <laughs> it's all my wife's fault, actually, because she was the one that encouraged me. She's like, no, no, make it creepier. I'm like, okay, so I will. Because, you know, sh the way she does it, because, like, my wife can be kind of toppy with me, and so, like, she'll be like, make it creepier. You can make it creepier, right? And so, like, that's kind of like a dare. And so, like, I made it creepier. She's like, ah, you can make it creepier than that. I'm like, well, okay. So I made it creepier. <laughs> and then that's what came out. <laughs> All right, let me just put the date in my little handy dandy spreadsheet here. Alrighty. And uh, official crazy, hello. Sorry I wasn't talking to you specifically, but um, I do not pay attention to chat while I'm doing my podcast reading, which is what you were just hearing. I hope uh, you enjoyed it, though. <laughs> Um, so that is it for today. Let me, let me see who's on and I can, uh, figure out where to send you. Doopy doo. Who we got here? Mm. Doopy doo. Oh. All right. You know, I'm gonna, um, I'm going to read a channel that it's kind of a, um, a um, it's a kind of a, a person who does a lot of random stuff and some of you may have seen him on uh, like TikTok and things like that and I think they're wonderful people and um, I'm going to try rating them and see how it goes. <laughs> so um, anyway, I hope you all have a wonderful weekend and um and a wonderful week. I am going to be off next week. And I will see you back. Um, what is it? Uh, gosh, I can't even remember dates today. Uh, I will see you back here on June 10th. So um, you all have a great week. And um, we will see you then. Have a good one, folks.